Thank you, Michael, and indeed uh, has been a great colleague of mine for the last 12 years, and we miss him in Bloomington. And um, thank you to the uh, Pearl and Jack Mandel family for sponsoring the lecture and uh, some of the people I know in the audience. I also just want to recognize a person who, um, besides Michael, I, I very much consider a teacher of mine. That's David Novak, and I'm very happy. And maybe the last weird figure that I've written on is David Novak. <laughs> but he meant that in a positive, only in the positive. Actually comparing him to the Satmar Rebbe. So some of... <laughs> And David knows because he's, seen, he's already seen the essay and responded to it um, in any event. Um, so what I want to talk about, it, it's a bit of a provocative title and meant to be so, and a provocative subject. And I want to say at the outset that um, I don't want what I, what I have to say to be in any way considered either disrespectful or offensive. Uh, people come from all kinds of backgrounds some direct, some indirect experience, um, either with the Hasidic world of Satmar or with the Holocaust. But in the spirit of, uh, of scholarship, I think that um, it's really worth trying to understand what uh, Yoel Teitelbaum, the Satmar Rebbe, had to say uh, in depth about the Holocaust and particularly about Zionism. So Rabbi Yoel Teitelbaum, who lived from 1887 to 1979, also known as the Satmar Rebbe, was one of the leading ultra-Orthodox figures to survive the Holocaust. After being saved from almost certain death in Bergen-Belsen by the <coughs> Zionist Katzner transports, Teitelbaum spent about a year in Palestine before immigrating to New York, where he spent the rest of his life between a home in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, and a Satmar enclave, Kerios Yoel, in Rockland County, New York. In 1952, Visiting Jerusalem and donating substantial funds to the ultra-Orthodox community there, he was appointed the Av Beitin, or the head of the Eid Haredit, which is the ultra-Orthodox rabbinical association, the largest rabbinical court, the largest ultra-Orthodox rabbinical court in Jerusalem, and he remained the Eid's honorary president until his death in 1979, even though he spent his life in the U.S. Teitelbaum was largely responsible for rebuilding the communities of ultra-Orthodox Jews from Hungary and Romania, decimated in the Holocaust, while his Hasidic court in Satumari, also known as Satmar, was relatively small. He became a magnet for survivors from those regions after the war. His extreme ideology, both religious and political, trans was transplanted from the Marmaros region of Hungary, where ultra-Orthodoxy espoused rigid separatism from all forms of secularism as an act of redemptive piety. Zionism was for him and most other religious leaders from that region a volatile mix of secular, secularism dressed in religious event, redemptive language that was particularly dangerous because it held the seductiveness of resolving the diasporic Jewish problem of anti-Semitism. There are many instances one could bring to illustrate this point. For example, we read in his Divrei Yoah, which is his collected novella on the Torah, as follows. It is not sufficient that God took us out of Egypt. It is still necessary to remove Egypt from within us. For this we need divine help to get to its source and uproot Egypt from our insides. And this is even more true in other exilic residences. The demonic shell and ruler of the, that nation wants dominion over our bodies and wants to enter inside of us. We need divine aid to be safe from this, to separate ourselves, therefore it says, from amidst the nations. This is a general warning for all generations to distance themselves from the defilement of the nations and not to allow the demonic shells of that nation to enter us. This is the preparation for the Messiah, as was taught by Rabbi Isaac Luria. Now this statement could easily have been said by a Zionist as well, and we'll see where it kind of turns in on itself. The process of purification, which for Teitelbaum was the true messianic act, requires residing in exile, and through living separately from the nations, slowly excise Egypt from the midst of Israel. On this reading, diasporaism, for him, is the only true messianism. As Jewish historian Amos Funkenstein put it, and I quote, according to Teitelbaum, a catastrophe was imminent 
after only which a few the remnants of Israel will survive to witness the true redemption. Indeed, Teitelbaum's whole argument is embedded in the apocalyptic premise that the true redemption through divine miracle is very close at hand. End quote. In addition to Chabad, Teitelbaum's community of Satmar are the most successful Hasidic groups in North America. But Teitelbaum is perhaps most widely known for articulating the most strident orthodox opposition to Zionism, articulated at great length and with immense learning in his two major works. Sorry. The first, Vayoa Moshe, was written in, written in the mid to late 1950s and first published in 1959. It consists of a series of three long essays developing different aspects of his opposition to Zionism. The most, the most well-known, called the Essay on the Three Oaths, is an extended and largely halachic study of a Talmudic passage regarding oaths made between God and Israel in light of Israel's exile. One of those oaths was that Israel would not ascend in mass to the land of Israel until the Messianic end time. His essay became the occasion for his first sustained attack on the state of Israel, the second essay, an essay on the holy tongue, Lashon HaKodesh, is on the sanctity of the Hebrew language, which he believed was being defiled by making it the lingua franca of the state. And the third essay, Essay on the Land of Israel, discusses the sacred status of the land <clears throat> and what can and cannot be done there according to Jewish law. The second work, Ala Geula Va'ala Tumura, translated as On Redemption and On Exchange, actually it's not yet translated, is a play on a verse from the book of Ruth 4.7 and its rendering in Rabbinic Midrash. This is a shorter work composed after the Six Day War in 1967 when Teitelbaum was almost 80 years old. In it he continues the legal arguments made in Vayo Moshe, but this second work is far more theological. I would even call it a political theology. Focusing on the nature of a miracle, idolatry, and false prophecy, ideas Teitelbaum felt were particularly relevant in the aftermath of the war. His anti-Zionism was distinctive among most post-war grand rabbis. As Menachem Karen Krantz, who recently wrote a PhD dissertation, uh, a biography of Yoel Teitelbaum with te in Tel Aviv University wrote, most Jews and Orthodox rabbis after the Holocaust were sympathetic to the Jewish state, even if they were suspicious of its secularism and the success of religion in Israel in the coming years. For the first five years, Rav Yoel Teitelbaum was the only one who continued to maintain a staunch anti-Zionist position, which had emerged earlier from the schools of radical orthodoxy in Transylvania and its environs. Until the late 1950s, however, Teitelbaum did not publish anything substantive on the subject, but made his views known in oral sermons and in various media, such as in, in the, his Yiddish paper, Dear Yid, that he uh, founded and was published by Satmar Hasidim. However, Teitelbaum worked hard to garner support from other Orthodox grand rabbis and fought hard against the Zionist influence of the ultra-Orthodox Agudat Yisrael in America. Here I want to focus on his final and most vociferous anti-Zionist testament in Alagaula Bala Tamura. In the introduction to Alagaula, which was the only part of the book that Teitelbaum actually wrote, the body of the book consists of essays compiled from talks that he gave in previous years. At the end of the introduction, Teitelbaum writes that by the time the work was in progress, he was already quite ill. He had had a stroke a few years before. And therefore, the introduction was that all he could provide. He writes that he reviewed all the essays included in the body of the work as he feared being misunderstood and underappreciated, something that seemed to bother him for much of his adult life. Alagaula is really the final testament of a man at the end of his life who believes the world is abandoning a messianic opportunity by succumbing to the work of satanic forces embedded in Zionism. My assumption is that Alagaula is a work of political theology. Of course, the term political theology was made popular by Karl Schmitt, a German legal theorist who later became a prominent member of the Nazi party. In his 1922 work, Political Theology, written there during the Weimar Republic, Schmidt argued that the main tenets of modern politics, all modern politics, were largely secularized forms of older theological ideas. Certainly unaware of Schmidt's work, Teitelbaum worked under the assumption that the present political reality of Zionism, taking into account the dire conditions that made it understandable, is a ref secular reflection of a theological drama that required immediate resistance. While Teitelbaum's remarks are embedded in various biblical episodes and midrashic renderings of those episodes, the presentist concerns 
are both the impetus of the work as well as its telos. In this work, as in Vayoel Moshe before it, Teitelbaum emerges often from his well-trained vocation as an expert exegete and homilist to make connections between rabbinic discussions of biblical episodes and his assessment of the heresy of Zionism. In other words, one needn't infer his anti-Zionism from his interpretive moves. While the three essays in Vayoel Moshe weigh in on what he considers the blasphemous act of creating a Jewish state in the land of Israel before the Messiah, it is only in his response to the 67 war where he explores the nature of this heresy in depth, and thus it is in his later work that a full Jewish political theology of the Antichrist appears. While many themes in Vayol Moshe reappeal in our Geulah Vala Temura, one feels in the latter volume after 67 an increased sense of urgency. In addition, the latter, more theological work focuses on the nature of miracle and its satanic implications as a response to the language of miracle. That, was a, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that arose surrounding Israel's victory in the Six-Day War. He notes in a couple of places in letters that he's, he was actually kind of, it was curious to him that in after 1967, all of the secular Israelis, none of whom believed in God and none of whom believed in miracle, all of a sudden were talking about the miracle of the Six-Day War. The messianic tenor of Al-Gaula is also more pronounced in Vayol Moshe, whereas Teitelbaum viewed the establishment of the state in demonic terms in Vayol Moshe. For Teitelbaum, it was precisely the victorious nature of 67 that confirmed for him Zionism's satanic roots. That is, for the very same reason many in the ultra-Orthodox community, which was his intended audience, became more sympathetic to Zionism. In an English biography of Teitelbaum entitled The Rebbe, an abbreviated version of the eight-volume Moshianchi Yisrael in Hebrew, David Miles reports that Teitelbaum knew that even many who attended his own synagogue were moved by the ostensible miraculous nature of Israel's victory in 67. So that the Six-Day War in 67 became a watershed for the acceptance of Zionism, not only among Jews who may have been ambivalent beforehand, including many in, in the, in the ultra-Orthodox community, but in the larger world as well. One example can be found in the very popular evangelical work, The Last Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. Lindsey argues that the Jewish state in 1948 and the conquest of Jerusalem in 1967 are sure signs that we are living in the generation of the final redemption. And of course, for those of you that know Lindsey's work, know, know that it was very widely read in the US. This became quite common among American evangelicals as well as the larger American Christian community. While Teitelbaum was likely unaware of Lindsay and the evangelicals, he was, aware, he was well aware of this general inclination and thus his view of Zionism as an antichrist becomes more pronounced in al Ga'ula than in his earlier work. It is Zionism's success in 67 that becomes the proof for him of its demonic stature. In general terms, Teitelbaum's ideological commitments against Zionism are not new, but, much, but part of a much larger trajectory of Hungarian Jewish anti-Zionism that stems back to the early 20th century in the work of Chaim Eliezer Shapira of Munkach, the old settlement Jews in Palestine, and later in the Turi Karta in Israel. This, the, this anti-Zionism was also shared by much of the pre-war ultra-Orthodox world from Lithuanian giants like Elchanan Wasserman to Lubavitcher Rebbe Shalom Dov Schneerson and Yosef Yitzhak Schneerson, among many others. The difference between Teitelbaum and the others is that only Teitelbaum spent significant intellectual capital developing a political theology that not only reacts to the circumstantial instantiation of Zionism as heresy, but places it in a theological context that has its roots in the Israelite rebellion of the golden calf, Job's blasphemous response to his suffering, the Israelites' rebellion against Moses in the desert, and the history of miracle in the Israelite Jewish tradition. Much of this can be found explicitly in his writings. In addition, Teitelbaum, as opposed to other Hasidic leaders, did not soften his position over time, but quite the opposite, saw the success of Zionism as its unholy nature. What I want to argue this afternoon is that Teitelbaum's writings against Zionism moves into uncharted territory in post-Rabbinic Jewish literature and constitutes a full-blown Jewish theology of the Antichrist. The term Antichrist, of course, is a Christian term of which Teitelbaum was unaware, as far as I know, yet one that is born from biblical sources which Teitelbaum knew in great nuance and detail. 
My use of the term, while provocative, intentionally so, is not meant to suggest any direct correlation between the idea of the Antichrist and Christianity, which has its own rich and complex history, with Teitelbaum's claim that Zionism is a divinely ordained satanic manifestation that serves as the final test before redemption. Here I want to suggest that post-Rabbinic Jews were not unaware of the notion of an Antichrist that would serve as the final messianic text. In her recent work on Sefer Zvu Babel, a text written in Hebrew by Jews in Byzantium in the 6th century, Martha Himmelfarb writes as follows. If I am correct, Sefer Zvu Babel provides a lens that allows us to see the evidence that rabbinic literature provides us with the messianic hope and eschatological expectations of Jews outside the circles of the rabbinic elite during the century in which the rabbis kept their distance from their hopes, from those hopes. Sefer Zerubavel introduces us to the figure of Armelos, who also appears in, mediev in the medieval Midrash Sefer Eliyahu, the son of the wife of Satan, literally taken from the name, likely taken from the name Romulus or Rome, as the great last enemy of the Jews, a kind of antichrist figure for the Jews. Later in the text, and also in the Syriac work Pseudo Ephraim's Sermon on the End, written in the sixth, late 6th century, where I introduced to another Antichrist figure or false messiah who claims to be the messiah but fails to resurrect the dead. On these and other examples, Himmelfarb writes, sorry, the presence of episodes in which the Antichrist claims divinity in both Jewish and Christian works suggest that such an expectation was widespread. What I'm suggesting from this brief interlude is that the notion of a figure who emerges as the final test before the true Messiah is not solely the provenance of Christianity, but existed in medieval Jewish texts who were also reading the book of Daniel and the book of Job as a template for their present situation. So I use the term Antichrist as opposed to, say, false messiah, because all false, false messiahs, or perhaps more accurately, rejecting all false messiahs in Judaism, are not necessarily a prelude to the true messiah who waits in the wings as the Jews make their choice. Only the Antichrist plays such a pre-redemptive role. Here I think loose antecedents to Teitelbaum's rendering of Zionism can be found in the medieval monk Joachim de Fiore, and more, in more, more particularly in Martin Luther. Beginning with Fiore and then more so in reformist thinking, the Antichrist moves from apocalyptic, mythic, and biblical references largely divorced from the realities of its author authors to apply to historical events and the imminent end time. And specifically with Luther, we find that the Antichrist is no longer some external oppressive regi regime such as Rome for the Jews, but is actually within the church itself. In fact, for Luther, it is the church itself. Once we move deeper into reformist theology, institutions, specifically the papacy, become the target of antichrist accusations. Martin Luther's 1545 work against the Roman papacy, an institution of the devil, shifts the discussion of the antichrist to a presentist model where it remains for the next two centuries. And the notion that the antichrist emerges from within the church will become relevant as we look at Teitelbaum's rendering of the Golden Calf episode below. On this, Bernard McGinn writes as follows, what was Luther's real originality in the history of the Antichrist traditions? The reformer's rejection of the legendary accretions to the scriptural picture of Antichrist and his adherence to a totally collective interpretation of the final enemy distinguish him from any medieval view even those that identified institutions of the papacy with the last enemy. Teitelbaum continues to utilize satanic imagery as depicted in classical midrash and biblical exorcists, but connects these episodes to the contemporary reality of Zionism and the Israeli state. For him, Zionism functions in a way that the papacy functioned for Luther. It is the embeddedness of the satanic in the body of the great institution of contemporary collective life. For Luther, the papacy, for Teitelbaum, the Jewish nation state. Teitelbaum's use of classical literature is primarily because this is his intellectual world, and secondarily, he used it as a tool to engage his ultra -orthodox, orthodox colleagues who he believed were being seduced into the demonic embrace. 
The idea of the Antichrist is rooted in a Satan figure in the book of Job, in the book of Daniel. Here's an example from Daniel. The king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god, and he will speak awful things against the god of gods. He will prosper until his wrath is spent, and what has been decreed has been accomplished. The king here is the Antichrist, or the king here is at least the, the, the satanic um, figure. This is one of the reasons I suggest that Teitelbaum includes a long excursus on the book of Daniel and on the book of Job in the body of Allah Ga'ul of Allah Tamura. Understanding the relationship between Satan and Job, examining the midrashic deployment of Satan in the Golden Calf episode, is crucial for Teitelbaum's assessment of the world around him, especially given his belief in the proximate opportunity of redemption after the Holocaust. The idea of an Antichrist figure emerges from Satan in Job, Daniel, and Midrashic renderings of the Golden Calf, and it's taken up in Jewish apocryphal and then Christian literature when it merges with Messianism, arguing that the final redemption is by design preceded by the emergence of a satanic figure, or figures, or individuals, or communities, or even ideologies, who test the community of believers' fidelity to God's word and will. The satanic figure appears as the arbiter of divine will, often performing miraculous feats, having great, almost unprecedented success. Remember, this is right after 67. Such that by all appearances, he is the emissary of God. This speaks to a difference between Teitelbaum and his anti-Zionist predecessor, Chaim Eliezer Shapiro. Aviezer Ravitsky, in his study of these two figures, describes this difference succinctly, and I quote, the Munkacha Rebbe need only ask, where is the source of this wickedness? The Satmar Rebbe, however, needed to go on and ask, what is the source of their worldly success? Simply this means that since Shapiro died in 1936, never having to confront the worldly success of Zionism, but it also speaks to the worldly success as the cornerstone of Teitelbaum's political ideology of the Antichrist. The success of Zionism is the crucial question Teitelbaum must answer, especially after 1967. And thus for him, the failure of the defiled ideology of Zionism to meet its end, that is to bring the Messiah, does not prove its source in divine will, as the claim, the claim of many religious Zionists, but the proof of its Antichrist status. To make the case, he must resort to the very ideology that founds the Antichrist ideologies of the past. Generally, Antichrist theologies argue that Satan is, in fact, the emissary of God, but functions as a tool of seduction, one who arises immediately before the appending redemption is the final test of the, to the community of believers. Antichrist theology is also almost always connected to a messianic claim. What is required of the community of believers is resistance rather than acquiescence to satanic seduction. This amounts to a kind of Jewish post-tribunalist idea that the Antichrist comes to test the faithfulness of the community of believers. By all accounts, Teitelbaum knew that Zionism appeared as a liberating force for the Jews, certainly after 1967, especially, and especially in the wake of the destruction of European Jewry in the Holocaust. And yet it is precisely Zionism's success, especially after 67, that convinces him of God's real use of Zionism as the final test that requires resistance. And it's worth noting here that it, there's more than a passing similarity between Teitelbaum and Rev Cook. Both believed that Zionism was part of a divine plan, and both viewed it as a prelude to redemption. Cook, in a dialectical manner, claimed the response should be one of embrace, even as Zionism contradicted the contours of a, of, a, of a redemptive prelude, even according to his criteria. While Teitelbaum took Zionism on what we may call a pshat level, an exercise in successful heresy, and understood it as a final test to be resisted. Antichrist ideologies in Christianity are founded on a very developed notion of the Satan and his seriology something less prominent but not totally absent in Jewish sources. The most prominent Jewish sources where Satan appears, including medieval midrashim such as Pirkei de Rav Liezer, the books, the medieval books of the German, uh, the Rhineland pietists, and of course Kabbalah, both in the Zohar and Luriana Kabbalah, and so forth. It's interesting that Teitelbaum makes use of the midrashic sources and he cites German pietism 
Sefer Chasidim and Sefer Rokeach occasionally, but he never uses any Kabbalistic source where mention of Satan and the Sitra Achra or the other demonic other side are plentiful. For example, in the introduction to Alagoula, which is the only thing that he wrote, there is not one mention of the Zohar, and in the body of the text he refers to the Zohar and Luriana Kabbalah only in passing. He was certainly well versed in this literature. The only thing I can suggest is that since this is a work of political theology, one he wished would reach as wide an audience as possible within the ultra-Orthodox community, he focused on the textual tradition that was most widely accepted, the normal, normal tradition of rabbinic literature. This would include Talmud, Midrash, biblical commentary, which he uses quite often, and of course, Maimonides. In this way, no one can discount his approach as simply Kabbalistic and thus not normative. It's true that Teitelbaum was less interested in Kabbalah than most of his Hasidic contemporaries, as one can see from his Torah homilies and Tivri Yol, but its absence in, this anti, in, in his anti-Zionist writings is particularly striking. Alternatively, Teitelbaum was well aware of the dialectical nature of many medieval Kabbalistic texts that suggest that holiness resides in the husk of evil that awaits redemption. That, in a certain sense, was the source of Rev. Cook's political theology. The dialectical tendency of Kabbalistic discourse could easily be deployed to undermine Teitelbaum's more binary motto whereby, quote, as he quotes often, evil never comes from good. While Kabbalah could support his argument on the one hand, it could just as easily refute it on the other. In al Gaul of Al-Tamura we read, it is known in our literature that as soon as there is a sign of our redemption and the salvation of our souls, Satan devises ways to exchange it with false redemption that brings sorrow, anguish, and darkness to the world. Rabbeinu Gershom, in his gloss to Babylonian Talmud Tamid 32a on the word Satan will be successful, says, do not be surprised that Satan is successful in leading them astray by offering them redemption and then leading them to hell. Later on, Teitelbaum further quotes a rabbinic source that I have been unable to locate in its original, Satan is given permission to perform miracles and wonders in its establishment of idolatry. This sentiment appears in various medieval Kabbalistic texts, but I've been able, uh, unable to locate it, its, its rabbinic source. It's important to note that the context for Alagoula is, uh, is one of impending redemption, in line with almost all other Antichrist ideologies. The messianic tenor is inextricably intertwined with the Holocaust, and thus Teitelbaum's Jewish Antichrist theology can be categorized as a kind of post-Holocaust messianic theology. What I mean here is that I think for him the Holocaust created the conditions for a new theological frame, one where the Antichrist would come by design as the final stage before redemption. Thus, in some way, Zionism is not a surprise for Teitelbaum, but actually quite expected. Something had to come. From another perspective, he also blames Zionism for the Holocaust. On this reading, it is not so much that the Holocaust created the conditions for the rise of the Antichrist, but the rise and acceptance of the Antichrist, that is Zionism that of course precedes the Holocaust, yields divine punishment in the Holocaust. In his essay on the Three Oaths, he claims that Israel, breaking its oath by immigrating and mass to the land of Israel, severs its covenantal promise of divine protection, which then unleashes the evil that became for us the Shoah. The continued success of Zionism is due to the retraction of divine protection in a world as a result of Israel's choices. Teitelbaum begins his essay on the Three O's in Bayo Moshe with a short reflection on the Holocaust, which I suggest is the contextual frame of the entire work. In it, he applies two things. First, the Holocaust was not so much the punishment for Israel's secularization via their enlightenment, a common theme among ultra-Orthodox leaders at the time, as much as the emergence of Jewish nationalism and Zionism. Abrogating the oath against immigrating to Israel en masse becomes the sine qua non of Teitelbaum's theopolitics as it exemplifies a rejection of the oath Israel swore to God and then removes the covenantal protection promised by God. Second, his belief that the decimation of European Jewry was a sign of the final purging of Israel before redemption. Here, he ironically agrees with many religious Zionists, inclu including Svi Yehuda Cook. However, Cook and Teitelbaum diverge in terms of their interpretation of the event. Svi Yehuda Cook, for example, viewed the Holocaust as an act of what he called divine surgery, Nituach Elohi. 
that forced the Jews to abandon the diaspora and immigrate to the land of Israel, for him a prerequisite of redemption. Tito Van viewed the Holocaust in the opposite manner. For him, the Holocaust and then the success of Zionism are part of a continuum. Amos Funkenstein reads Teitelbaum in the following way. For Teitelbaum, the Holocaust came because the Jews were too active. For the Gush Emunim, disciples of Cook, because Jews were too passive. For both, it was the portent, sorry, the mistake there, of the Messiah. Both are part of the emergence of the Antichrist. Zionism is the Antichrist that then seduces Israel to break its oath with God that then results in the unleashing of the evil of the Holocaust. For, Ty for Teitelbaum, the proper response to this turn of events was to remain binaries of divine will and sin and not to view history dialectically, that is, to construct a theology whereby transgression cannot be a vehicle for the good. One of the repeating tropes in Teitelbaum's writings is the Talmudic dictum, evil cannot come from God, or sin cannot bring about the holy. While this may gesture toward the Sabbatean heresy of Gershom, as Gershom Shalom coined it, HaMitzvah Baba Avera, problematically translated as redemption through sin, Teitelbaum likens Zionism to Sabbateanism quite often in his work. Even worse than Sabbateanism because of its success, it is just as likely that Teitelbaum was referring to Cookian thinking the extent to which he knew about it. And he does refer to Cook a number of times, not in these works and other works. For Teitelbaum, the proper response to the emergence of Zionism as a final test is resistance to the understandable temptation of Jews to believe that they are the agents of their own survival, that they can procure what God did not give them. In this sense, while some view Zionism as a mitzvah, the embodiment of the biblical mandate, you shall inherit the land and settle it, and David Novak wrote about that extensively in his book on Judaism and Zionism, Teitelbaum views such action as the quintessential sin the final rejection of divine sovereignty and thus the protective layer of the divine covenant. Teitelbaum was not wrong in his assessment that for many Zionists, Zionism indeed was an act of disbelief that God would save them from reduction. As opposed to Zionism inaugurating the first flowering of redemption, Shai Agnon's felicitous phrase included in the liturgy for the state of Israel, for Teitelbaum, Zionism is the tragic flaw of the Jews. This is why much of Alagaula is a long meditation on the golden calf. He often refers to the golden calf of Zionism. The irony of succumbing to the Antichrist is that it is a sin that is in large part unintentional. Here, Teitelbaum leans heavily on Nachmanides' rendering of the golden calf narrative that the majority of those worshiping the calf, not the Erev Rav, who forced Aaron to make it, but the majority of the Israelites who worshiped the calf, according to Nachmanides, did so with the intention of serving God. Those who were guilty of idolatry were killed immediately, as we see in Exodus 32, 27. And the remainder were punished with not being able to go into the land of Israel, but were not, were not killed, as Exodus 32, 30. Precisely because for most of those worshipers, their intentions were noble. Teitelbaum views the entire narrative as an illustration of the calf as the Antichrist. His understanding of the calf as an instation of the Antichrist is based on Targum Yonatan's rendering of Exodus 32, 19. As soon as Moses came near the camp and saw the calf in the dancing, he became enraged. Cleverly shifting the verb dancing from the Israelites to Satan, the Targum reads, Satan was in the calf and leapt out before the people. The miraculous nature of the event was interpreted by the Israelites as divine intervention, and so they responded in kind by dancing, by imitating Satan who, was, who, had, who had come out of the calf. The miracle was precisely the trap. This is how Teitelbaum understands the Six-Day War. It was indeed a miracle, like Satan jumping from the calf in the desert. <coughs> The notion of Satan entering into the bodies of righteous Christians is a common thread in late, anti in late antique Antichrist theology. Moreover, the notion of Jewish devils, Shedin Yehudaim, appears already in the Zohar, in Sabbateanism, and in early Hasidism. The Zohar uses the term Jewish devils to refer to rational philosophers, the Sabbateans to those who do not believe in Shabbatai Tzvi, and the Hasidim to its opponents, the Mitnagdim. Thus, Teitelbaum's use of satanic language to describe other Jews, in this case the Zionists, is certainly not new. 
While the calf is not mentioned as far as I know in Christian Antichrist literature, the Teitelbaum certainly didn't know this literature, the Christian sources could have easily been aware of Targum Yonikon and Pirkei de Eliezer, chapter 45, where the satanic depiction of the calf that you see on the screen is mentioned. My point here is that for Teitelbaum, Zionism is very much a part of the divine plan and very much a part of the impending messianic drama. He is a messianist no, lo no less than Abraham Isaac Cook, although unlike Cook, he views passive passivity or political quietism as the quintessential messianic act. The question of pacifism is a complex one, as I don't see any indication that Teitelbaum was a pacifist, although he does have an interesting essay on war published in the latter printings of uh, Alagu Ulaval Tamura, but he was more of a political quietist, believing that resisting Zionism rather than justifying it is acting in fidelity to tradition. In any event, he shares the notion that Zionism has a role to play in the messianic drama with the radical with the radical Zionism. He shares the notion that Zionism has a role to play in the messianic drama with the radical Zion, religious Zionist camp, the Cookians. The difference between Teitelbaum and Cook is that Teitelbaum sees Zionism as the Antichrist and not the Redeemer, that the proper response is not to dialectically envision how redemption can come from sin, but how redemption is the final eradication of sin through resistance. Cookian views Cookian thinking views Zionism and its success as part of the unfolding redemptive drama. For Teitelbaum, di diaspora is not a consequence of history, but part of the covenantal design. In Vayol Moshe, citing a Midrash, Teitelbaum writes, it is known that this is the fourth kingdom of exile and no one will be able to collect them from to bring them to redemption except by means of the merit of the avenger. That is, we need to guard the mitzvot and to wait to fulfill, do not partake of any of it. That is before the apportioned time. Because of our sins today, as redemption nears, the multitude became ensnared in this to transgress the raw warning of not partaking and have taken from the bitter food and thus prolong the exile, heaven forbid. This seduction, coming close to the time for redemption, is clearly an Antichrist idea. Teitelbaum introduces us to the notion that the Antichrist is not purely Christian, nor is it an external oppressive regime like Rome, but rather it is deeply embedded in Hebrew scripture and apocrypha and is present throughout the exegetical tradition in episodes such as the golden calf, divine license given to Satan in the book of Job, and the power of demonic miracle. And we see similar manifestations in some of the great schisms of Jewish history, Rabbinites versus Karaites, Kabbalists versus philosophers, Sabbateans versus Rabbinites in the modern period, Hasidim versus the Mitnagdim. Teitelbaum's extreme position, especially given the historical conditions that existed after the Holocaust, which he knew firsthand, makes his political theology empirically difficult to accept, albeit that would only strengthen his claim of the very nature of the test. Like Sabbateanism and a lot of messianic and heretical ideologies, he is, it's often wed to a kind of circular logic, whereby the very rejection is an affirmation of the truth. However, even if one rejects Teitelbaum's political theology and his assessment of Zionism as the final test to be resisted, it may at least enable Jews, especially those who are deeply invested in the classical tradition as more than simply a record of the past, but also a map for the future, to question the extent to which contemporary Jewry of all stripes seems to ignore the very possibility that theologically, at least, Zionism could be precisely the opposite of what we think. Like all human communities, our vision is limited to the singular frame in which we live. Our understanding of the past is limited to our knowledge of the future, and our, our understanding of the past is limited, and our knowledge of the future is non-existent. We can only think from where we stand. Teitelbaum would argue that for any religious Jew to consider Zionism possible, he or she must look for precedent in the tradition to justify that possibility. He finds no precedent yet finds ample precedent for its opposite, that is, for Zionism as the manifestation, as a divine test facilitated through a satanic force. The very notion of the success of Satan in Babylonian Talmud Tamid that we saw a moment ago should at least enable that question to be a live hypothesis, even if, as William James might put it, we will to believe otherwise. In sum, then, I suggest that we read Teitelbaum's Alagu'ula 
as a full-blown political theology that rests on the notion that a final test before redemption will come by Satan returning to the world, looking and acting like a savior. A few questions remain. First, is Teitelbaum a kind of apocalyptic thinker? He, doesn't, he never predicts the end time, nor does he write in apocalyptic tones, but in some way his Jewish antichrist thinking has apocalyptic implications. The second question is his question of pa the question of pacifism. Setting aside the often inflammatory language and imagery, he never advocates any action to overthrow the state. His preference is to avoid the state and to call for its dismantling, not because of animus against the Jews. Certainly, Teitelbaum is not an anti-Semite. Teitelbaum diverted, devoted his entire life quite successfully to rebuilding Jewish communities after the Holocaust, but because he views it as a heretical act, no less egregious, perhaps more than the sin of the golden calf in Exodus. Even more strongly for Teitelbaum, the call to dismantle the state in his mind and according to his reading of the sources for the, I'm sorry, for Teitelbaum to call to dismantle the state is in his mind and according to his reading of the sources for the sake of Jewish survival, although he never advocated any action toward that end. In fact, he broke with Naturi Karta in the 1960s precisely because of Naturi Karta's activism against the state by engaging with its enemies. And I also want to say that one of the reasons that I think he's an interesting piece in this larger puzzle is that he is no less radical a thinker and, to my mind, no less problematic a thinker than Rev. Cook. He is better understood as a premillennial separatist rather than a postmillennial militant activist. A useful contrast here, which I have made elsewhere, this is in a in, a, in an article in which I gauged Teitelbaum, Mayor Kahana, and David Novak on this question, would be between Teitelbaum and militant rabbi Mayor Kahana, who shared some of Teitelbaum's apocalyptic ideas toward opposite ends. Kahana's open militancy became, can be contrasted with Teitelbaum's seeming pacifism, even, even as both advocated enclavist ideologies. Teitelbaum in his upstate New York village, Karius Yoel, and Kahana in the state of Israel. Teitelbaum viewed Zionism as a failure by design, whereas Kahana viewed Zionism as a failure due to its choice to adapt Western criteria for the state. In any case, as we reach the end of the 50th anniversary of the Six-Day War, Teitelbaum's political theological response is one that does not get much attention, surely to my mind, not the careful attention it deserves. Thank you very much.